Our next speaker uh, speaks in the Club Me track, um, but that involves a lot of technology as well, albeit in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Rachel Arthur. She is the co-founder and chief innovation officer at The Current, which is a consultancy, a UK-based consultancy, transforming how fashion brands and retailers intersect with technology. Um, Club Me because Personal data um, are transforming the way we engage with physical space. Pete presented it earlier. Uh, he presented the Nike example, uh, the new store that Nike made in uh, New York and also Shanghai, I learned yesterday. Um, these are examples of, um, let's say, future forward retail operations that employ technology uh, in ways that we haven't seen before, making for a totally different and more personal shopping experience. And I'm really curious to hear Rachel Arthur's perspective on the store of the future. Please welcome Rachel Arthur. a long walk. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so I'm here, hopefully this will come up. I'm here to talk about technology um, and I'm going to talk about data, but I really want to talk about being human within all of that. It's a really big part of our practice and what we believe in. Before I begin, just a, a little bit um, on, on us and what we do. So my name's Rachel and I'm the co-founder and chief innovation officer of uh, the current global. And what we're about essentially is brokering deals between retailers, fashion brands specifically, but across the lifestyle space more broadly, and startups. We really believe in this idea of open innovation. Too much of our industry has spent time trying to build technologies internally and um, not found great success in it. So what we do is go out around the globe, find the best experts in any given field of technology, and bring them in, broker those deals, run the pilot programs, and ultimately look to integrate the technology for the business. There's a lot there that is behind the scenes technology, foundation technology, and then a lot that is experiential and a lot to do with how the customer is interacting with it, um, both online and offline. So all sorts going on. This is what we really believe in, the idea of actionable innovation. I come from a world of strategy where we are really, really good at writing reports and not so good at actually putting that um, into action in the real world. So that's what we're all about today. We've just actually brought on a CTO who was the founder of the Innovation Lab at Neiman Marcus and worked there for 20 years. So this is really starting to transform the way that we operate. Um, and what I wanted to do today is show you what we mean by actionable innovation and how you can achieve that in a world that is really increasingly marred with lots and lots of buzzwords and no meaning or true focus on ROI. So to kick us off, I want us to first consider the fact that we are in the midst of entering the fourth industrial revolution. In its simplest sense, this is really about emerging of the physical, digital, and biological worlds. Now, you'll already be seeing this in terms of how it's affecting the way that you work, and steadily it's impacting our day-to-day -day as well, how we live, how we play, and everything else. Much like steam, electricity, and IT or digital before, this era is set to revolutionize the world once again. But this time, it's based on a series of emerging technologies, all sorts of different ones, from the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, bioengineering, and more. There is a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity in this. Um, it's leading to a lot of progress, but what I want to do here is really overly simplify it and talk to you primarily today about the role of data. So we all know that we have been experiencing a complete data explosion um, in life, and this is truly at the hands of the fourth industrial revolution and our ever-connected lifestyles. In 2013, there were 2.5 quintillion quintillion, <laughs> I don't even know how many zeros that is, but quintillion bytes of data created every single day. That's according to IBM. And that's the equivalent of 90% of the world's data being created in the previous two years alone. 
Now jump to today, and obviously we've seen the rise of the Internet of Things. We've seen our um, increasingly connected lifestyles ourselves, let alone obviously what is being created from industry. And it's almost impossible to continue to calculate the volume of data that we are consistently producing for the very fact it is constantly changing and increasing. What it supports, however, is the idea that data has become one of our most valuable commodities. Data is the new oil is a very, very common used phrase these days. The issue is with so much data, we can't just use humans to make sense of it. We need systems and we need machines. So machine learning and artificial intelligence is the resulting power. Now, AI is often referred to as the alpha trend of the fourth industrial revolution, and that's because of the fact that it underpins everything. I spent a long time listening to talks that talk about AI being a trend, and I can tell you it's not a trend, it is something that is here to stay. As I said, it underpins nearly everything else we see in terms of emerging technologies. In fact, this quote sums it up really, really brilliantly, and in itself, this is already a few years old. Everything invented in the past 150 years will be reinvented using AI within the next 15. And I'm not talking about robotics here. I'm not talking about some dystopian view of artificial intelligence or even close to a broad general artificial intelligence because that's still quite a long way off. What I'm actually talking about is machine learning or the use of algorithms to drive greater efficiency around our understanding and application of data. Now, at the same time as that's all progressing, what we also know is that consumers are rapidly evolving too. We are living in a time when the new global consumer is the most advanced we've ever seen. I don't need to tell you that because you're in this room as one of them. We're witnessing a mass increase in urbanization, a rapidly rising global middle class. And the result is a consumer that is, of course, mobile first, highly empowered. They are constantly connected they have an abundance of choice and the ability to make informed and smart choices as a result. And most, most importantly, the expectation to get what they want, when they want, and where they want it, which means they're more demanding and tougher than ever to please. Needless to say, the role of data does come in here too. Consumers today, all of us included, are so used to algorithms influencing what we experience online, and particularly on mobile, that we increasingly expect levels of relevancy in all that we interact with. Already, 35% of what consumers purchase on Amazon and 75% of what they watch on Netflix comes from product recommendations from such algorithms, according to McKinsey. So all in all, users are becoming accustomed to interactions that are entirely tailored to them as individuals due to such services. This idea of relevancy can also be referred to as the me economy. This is about not only meeting the desires of each and every consumer, but beginning to predict what they might um, be after before they're even aware that they are. Here's a really nice example of this growth happening. This shows that Google has seen a 60% growth in mobile searches for the phrase something for me in the past two years alone, which is super interesting. And that's a hypothesis that we can draw, is that a brand's ability to grow is going to be based increasingly on how it leverages data to anticipate user needs and desires. Keith Weed, the chief marketing and communications officer at Unilever, calls it a hyper-segmentation revolution. He says, as we move from mass marketing to massive customization, from focusing on averages to individuals, I believe that in the future, we will build brands in segments of one. And of course, all of that expectation is translating into physical space as well. And yet, when we look at retail, of course, we know that at large, this is an industry that has been suffering when it comes to physical footprint. In the UK, where I'm based, there was a 36% increase in store closures in 2018, according to Deloitte. Meanwhile, as of August 2018, the US had hit a 10-year high in retail square footage closing down. But I'm not one for crying the death of retail, simply because I don't believe in it whatsoever. What we're seeing right now is an evolution. 
but a really, really important one in terms of ways of doing business. After all, while we're seeing big box retailers and traditional formats closing doors, we see uh, once pure plays opening new brick and mortar outlets left, right, and center. And they're doing so by really thinking about innovation and new ways of thinking above all else. So here are three examples, some of the strongest, Everlane, Warby Parker, and Casper, all of which now have a significantly growing physical footprint. Sleep brand Casper actually has plans to open 200 store locations within the next three years, which doesn't particularly sound like the death of retail. Interestingly, unlike many of their more traditional counterparts, what ties these three together is a laser focus on the customer. These businesses are digital first, meaning they know who their customers are and they understand exactly what they want. For them, CRM, data, personalization, and relevancy have been key from the very, very beginning. So the notion of building brands in segments of one, both online and offline now, is their foundation. What I find really interesting, however, is that when people look at their success, what they tend to focus on is how great they are at building experiences in the real world. And don't get me wrong, they are, but there's a lot more to it than that. Traditional retail has really focused on this experiential side above all else. Opening coffee shops, running yoga classes, hosting talks in store, and more. In some cases, as with the two that I'm showing you here, that has really, really worked. But it's so key here to understand that sticking on experience isn't always the answer to broader retail woes. It's like sticking a plaster over a gaping wound or putting bells and whistles on things when you don't have your foundations established or fixed. Experiences work well when they're done right, but once again, they have to be about relevancy for the audience, and importantly, they really have to be about relevancy for the brand, which is so often missed. After all, there is little point in staging an event if the people attending don't ever convert into buying the shoes as well. On top of that, the other side we're seeing in fixing retail is CEOs or senior executives tending to think experiences mean new technologies, like the virtual mirror, a classic example of a gimmick in a space. It's an attempted quick fix that we know never quite works. Technology today should not be about grabbing attention, creating a bit of a PR buzz, but underpinning a much, much broader strategy. It's about making things seamless for the shopper, like being easier to pay, for instance. And it's about focusing on using data to create a better customer experience. Jose Neves, who is the founder and CEO of Farfetch, calls it enabling the offline cookie. At the moment, there is no data in, the no in a traditional store until the shopper checks out. By comparison, during a five-minute session on the Farfetch site, 15,000 data points are collected. The ultimate aim of the physical space, then, is to make it connected in order to collect data. And what that means is essentially knowing, essentially knowing who comes through the door on a one-to-one -one basis, but at scale. It's about a connected store enabling better, more consumer-centric, and one-to-one -one experiences thanks to data. And again, it's about relevancy and about the right algorithms. So here are some great examples of where we're seeing this in action um, thus far, beyond the direct-to-consumer brands that I already mentioned. The first one is matchesfashion.com, um, based in London. This is their brand new townhouse um, in Mayfair at Carlos Place. And this has really taken the idea of experiential retail to the next level. It's a five-story house and it's been completely refitted to allow shopping, live events, art exhibitions, and more. It also has recording facilities for broadcast, a fully functioning kitchen with a rotating series of different chefs and cafe owners, and a garden. However, it's not just about experiences. It's an appointment-only private shopping space as well, and it offers shoppers uh, real convenience, 90-minute delivery for anything that they don't have physically in the space to be delivered either there for them to try on or then at home. 
And while the house is really, really about human experience, there is a significant layer of technology behind the scenes as well, working to make it as relevant as possible. So users, when they arrive, check in at a desk with a concierge, and that then signs them into their Matches Fashion account on their phones, if they want to, opt in for a bespoke clientele experience with the sales associates in store. By knowing who the customer is, we can, of course, better serve them. Over in Montreal, meanwhile, this adaptable architectural feat for luxury and streetwear store sense enables visitors to browse its 20,000 items online and then share their digital wish list with the retailers 24 hours before they visit to gain access to a personalized fitting room with their chosen items. The space is supposedly completely empty until the customer decides what it is they want to see. And we're really seeing this idea of personal shopping growing in this data era. We have brands like this one and others like net porter who are using machine learning to enhance their stylists, giving them the ability to better predict what users would be interested in. Nothing stops the idea of a personalized fitting room in the real world, therefore, coming with algorithmic-led real-world product recommendations alongside. This one was mentioned this morning, Nike's new New York flagship. This unlocks both relevancy and experience. It allows customers to navigate the entire, entire experience in store on their phones. They can come in, scan items to buy them, or they can reserve them online first, and then they can even enter by a different entrance to get their items from a locker. They can also navigate certain sections of the store where the products on display are based on local trending data, so they know what's going to be popular, and they can spend time with the stylist and more. Furthermore, Nike Plus members can partner with a Nike expert to help them shop, working to get together to create a personal look. This store is about convenience and ease on steroids, but it has a true measure of personalization and relevancy thrown in. OK, to go a bit more techie, you're going to have to excuse the picture on the left. It's meant to be a picture um, of a woman um, using a facial recognition app, and I've forgotten to switch over. But uh, this comes from makeup brand philosophy. Imagine you can see somebody doing their makeup in a picture. Um, and essentially what this does is, is it um, takes loyal customers and um, uh, then recognizes and rewards them via this facial recognition technology. Basically what happens is when you enter the store, um, you're asked to take a selfie with your phone and then you send it to a designated phone number. Um, and registered customers can then be recognized on screens, which offers them special discounts, so that's the incentive to do it. Over time, they're then pushed uh, tailored notifications, and one-to-one -one consultants um, can then help them based on previous behavior. On the right is a sweet shop called Lolly and Pops from the US, and they've also trialed facial recognition as part of a loyalty scheme so that associates can welcome people by name as they enter the store and then share with them which of their latest products they think that they might like the most. There's a multitude of different technologies obviously working here to make this possible, but namely it's a connection between CRM and machine learning, all with that layer of identification placed on top to deliver results for the specific customer in question. Now, we've seen a lot of examples emerging around facial recognition technology, especially in China, where <coughs> it's being used for payments particularly. But this personalization option is really starting to increase. Now, I get it. A lot of you are going to be thinking this does sound really, really creepy, this idea. But remember, in each case, it is entirely opt-in. And when I say that, I literally mean you have to decide, I want to scan my face for somebody to then be able to recognize you. So you know you're doing it in advance. This is not that just somebody is going to suddenly recognize you, though I appreciate uh, that with lots of things happening online, that does feel like it could be the case. I'll touch a bit more on that a little bit later. Um, the other way that we're seeing relevancy happening is with the product itself. And this is less on the segment of one basis, but in terms of understanding localized data. So I already mentioned that being the case at Nike in New York, but the same goes for its Melrose store, as you can see here, where this first started. And this is essentially um, based on information collected from Nike Plus members nearby to see what their interests are, and then the product assortment is selected accordingly. So this is about data being applied to merchandising. H&M, meanwhile, has been doing something similar in Stockholm. 
uh, by analyzing purchases and returns in a much more granular way, so store by store, it was able to discover what people were really interested in locally, and then they um, increased sales off the back of it as a result. And then to take that concept to the next level, or to the individual level, perhaps, um, this is Walmart's new Sa Sam's Club Now concept store in Texas. Um, and what this has is machine learning to connect a customer's previous purchases to pre-populate a new shopping list. So basically to kind of predict what you might want when you go back into the store again. And then when you enter the store, what you're able to do is use that app to navigate to where, your, where those actual products are in the store space, just to make that process much, much quicker for you. OK, so I do have one mirror in here. Um, and I put it in here because I want to show that it doesn't always have to be a gimmick. It can actually be done very, very nicely when we think about um, the technology as service instead. Um, so this is uh, Shiseido's new flag flagship store in uh, Tokyo, beauty brand. Um, and what they're doing is using a connected mirror to offer more granular and personalized content than we've seen before, including around diagnosis, specifically for the skin. So customers visiting the store can have their picture taken by the mirror, which results in an individual skin analysis, and then step-by-step -step guidance on screen on how to apply a curation of products that best suits your individual needs. And then afterwards, you can scan a little QR code and that, um, that's generated on the screen again, and then that puts all of that data onto your phone so you can take it away. And all of this is done with a human alongside, so it's a more interactive experience as opposed to just one straight with a screen. Now, of course, if we're seeing that around service, um, it's no surprise that we're also seeing a surge in how personalization can lead into more tailored or bespoke products themselves, too. Now, of course, the basic idea of product customization has been in retail for some time. We've got your Nike ID sneakers that we all know well, through to the design studio for your perfect Tesla, or the standard monogramming that you can now do in the majority of luxury stores, whether it's scarves, bags, shoes, jackets. That one third of shoppers are interested in customized products, and 71% are prepared to pay a premium for it, according to Deloitte. And thus, we're starting to see this getting smarter at the hands of technology, too. On the left, this Adidas custom knitwear example enabled shoppers to print their sweaters in just four hours in Berlin. Basically, what you did is you chose the design elements that you wanted in advance through a little um, screen setup. And then you had it made to your exact size specifications. You were scanned, and it was made according exactly to what you wanted. When I say printed, what we've got here are industrial knitting machines that have, um, there's a few businesses now doing this, but essentially been hacked, if you will, so they can produce a single sweater at the same cost as what it traditionally costs to print or to produce about 10,000 in a go. So that's what's making this viable as a mass customization tool. Meanwhile, on the right, you've got Gucci's Soho store in New York. And this has a, a multitude of different technologies going on. One of the interesting ones is um, an app that uses augmented reality to allow the customer to point a camera at the tote bag or sneaker that they want to customize to then see what it will look like in a real-world setting once it's done. And so hopefully what you've seen here with the, these examples and all of the ones previously are lots of ways in which technology has truly helped impact greater relevancy in retail design and retail experience, and not just served as bells and whistles on top. Ultimately, what we're driving towards then is being able to do this at much greater scale, thanks to the technology advancements the fourth industrial revolution is bringing us. What we're seeing here is that the more connected and intelligent the systems are becoming, the more contextualized and personalized the experiences can become. But what you'll also hopefully have noticed from all the examples that I've shown is how many of them are also about being human, as I said at the beginning. Technology increasingly is really just a facilitator. It is not the true story. It's merely something that enhances the experience or enables the experience more than anything else. 
Now, as Ulrich Jerome, who's the CEO of Matches Fashion, said to me for a story when the Carlos Place store opened in London, the more people get digitalized, the more they want one-to-one -one conversations, and the more the personal touch gets very important. His focus with that store and the business at large is all about being human. Technology is only ever behind the scenes as a facilitator with the intention of better serving the customer. Now, one final thing to know. I'm sure all of you might be thinking, this is well and good, but what about data protection and privacy? And of course, that has to be top of mind in all of this for us to progress. When we're talking about creating experiences and strategy that is heavily reliant on data, we're also talking about increasing regulations and critically, consumer consent. Mary Meeker, who is one sort of the, the dame of internet trends, if you will, said last year, technology companies are facing a privacy paradox. They're caught between using data to provide better consumer experiences and violating consumer privacy. And arguably, I would say the exact same thing for retail companies. We know that data protection was the hot topic of 2018, off the back of the advent of GDPR, as well as a number of controversial data leaks, not least the large-scale Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal, which you will know saw 87 million individual user accounts improperly shared. In 2017, I find this data fascinating, 79% of people said they trusted Facebook to predict their, their privacy. In 2018, after the breaches, only 27% of people said the same, and I'm sure lots of you around the room would nod in agreement to that. On top of that, 82% of consumers today say they will not buy from a business that they don't trust to protect their data. Today's consumer, therefore, while expecting greater than ever relevancy and access to their own data, are becoming smarter and smarter about what they provide to businesses. Value exchange here is top of mind as customers ask what they can get in return for giving up such a commodity. So as we venture through 2019 and beyond, the role of data and algorithmic consumption will take increasing steps forward to a more predictive future, but respecting and abiding by privacy rights is only going to increase in terms of that mandatory status. Tim Cook of Apple says, it's time to face facts. We will never achieve technology's true potential without the full faith and confidence of the people who use it. And so, in conclusion, my view on understanding today's connected customer is to always think human first and tech second. Don't jump for the big technology story. Think about how AI or machine learning is there to enhance the human but don't think about it as replacing them, as we well know from this film here. Ultimately, should you know everyone by name? Yes, if they opt in for it. But more importantly, you should offer they, them a seamless retail experience that focuses on driving relevancy as much as you can throughout. At the end of the day, that's what's going to be more important from an ROI perspective than merely sticking on another yoga class. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Allow me to ask you one sure. little bit critical question. I have difficulties uh, embracing the kind of personalization as um, um, concepted by the likes of Netflix and Spotify. Um, if I go on Netflix and Spotify, there's a whole world out there, yet I'm presented um, what I am supposed to like. So actually, uh, while this whole wide world is available to me, Netflix and Spotify, based, based on their uh, AI uh, software, present me with something they think I like. So actually, they make my world smaller. And isn't the joy of walking around in a physical store uh, the joy of uh, serendipity, of encountering something that you don't know but you might like. Mm. And isn't this likely to disappear when retailers opt the kind of uh, software that Netflix and Spotify have implemented? Yeah, you've got Netflix FOMO. <laughs> Spare. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, listen. It's the beginning. It's the yeah. beginning. 
Absolutely, and I think that I think that is a very fair point. I think it's a balance with all of this. It's a balance. I think having that sort of relevancy for the individual is increasing. I think the way we will see it will be those kind of bespoke sort of experiences that are about the sort of personal shopping version initially. And I think that role of discovery has to exist. That's something that the online world has struggled with conversely. And so I think th that's the beauty of the physical space. But at the same time, if you're losing footfall, you need a way to drive people back in. It's around how you can do that in terms of ensuring them they're going to find what they want. But I agree with you, you know, that, that element of discovery is the beauty of the physical retail space. And I think it's, it's critical for brands to figure out how do you balance all of those things together. And I think that's where the experience side does come in. That's a lot to do with that, you know, uh, giving people access to things they wouldn't normally have access to in, in a bit of a new way. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you.